Hello everyone and welcome to episode 9 of The Power of Books. My name is Timo Lipner, I'm the founder of Timo's Notes and every week I interview popular non-fiction authors about their best-selling books. The goal of the show is to introduce you to new books and provide you with helpful advice and practical tools. My guest today is Gareth Timmins. Gareth is a former Royal Marines commando who has spent time in Iraq, Somalia, Egypt and Afghanistan. He has a diploma of higher education in psychology and a bachelor's degree in forensic psychology. In more recent years, Gareth founded the British fitness and adventure brand Nord Point One, which is inspired by the Royal Marine's high standard of excellence and performance. In this conversation today, we talk about Gareth's experience during training, the lessons he took away from this time, how everybody can apply them to their own lives and a lot more. So now let's get right into our conversation. Enjoy the show. Gareth Timmins, welcome to the Power of Books podcast. I'm very happy to have you on and talk about your book, Becoming the 0.1%. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be to join you and to be chatting with you. So in the beginning, I want to get into how this book came to life. So it all started with you um, writing a journal during your time, during your training time. And you mentioned the story in the beginning of the book that your mom gave you this journal just when you were about to leave for training. So what did you think back then? Like, how did you feel about writing a, a journal during training? <clears throat> It had never, ever been put on my radar whatsoever. Uh, I'd not done very well at school. Uh, so uh, I suppose me personally getting the, the, the diary uh, and writing the journal throughout training, it, it, just, it just wasn't on my, radar, on, my, on my radar whatsoever. My mum bought me it in a, in a station shop Uh, and just give me it just as the train doors were closing for me to go down from Wakefield Westgate to Limston to start training, which is about six hours south of, of the UK. And uh, I can just remember when I when I kind of took receipt of it, I just thought, what a bizarre present, what a bizarre gift, given that, uh, you know, I'm kind of at that point in, in, in my life, just not academically inclined. or Not that you have to be, but just that writing something down just w wasn't going to be my thing whatsoever. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got training, which is the hardest and longest physical training in uh, in the world, the, the tra training course in the world. So to to think about writing a journal during training was the magnitude of which was just absolutely massive. I mean, j just getting th through there without doing that is is incredibly tough. But I took it and uh, reluctantly took it, and then on the way down, I just I felt like a a range of emotions of excitement but also trepidation and and whatnot and I just I opened the diary and just kind of wrote in there just how I was feeling that I were excited but I kind of likened that to being on a roller coaster really where I were on my way down to start this elite training but I, I were excited but also felt scared and I wanted to get off the train just like you would on a roller coaster when it sets off you you, you kind of want to get off so I wrote that in and from the first moment that I'd kind of wrote that in I just felt absolutely uh, like I had to write in it every single day uh, and I suppose days turned into weeks 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 turned into months and I, I managed to get to the end and had a full diary of training really yeah it's so awesome because now in hindsight you you have all this like all these feelings and emotions and everything that you experienced written down and, and Yeah. For, for you to go back to and now for readers um, to like follow along the process but one thing I was wondering is like because you had a lot of like there was a lot of sleep deprivation stuff like that and like you didn't get a lot of sleep during training obviously but you still wrote in your diary every single day and yeah. I was wondering like did you feel like it at all or did it was it just a habit or why did you like keep doing it even though you were like so tired that I couldn't even imagine like writing yeah. something down in the, in the diary. It's a great question, mate. I've, I've, I've never really been asked that on, on any podcast, but uh, it was incredibly tough. There's been a lot of people that have said that my training must not have been hard 
if I've been able to do it, uh, because how could you uh, from people that have experienced it? But to answer your question, it was it was so incredibly tough to keep it up uh, and stay consistent with it and writing it every day, like like you've just mentioned. There were a period in a period in training of about eight to ten weeks where, uh, sorry, between week eight and week ten. Uh, in that two week period, we had 10 hours sleep. So we had like four or five days where we where we didn't go to sleep and there were lads falling asleep, stood up. Uh, but I still still felt completely compelled to write it, uh, to write in it because uh, I don't know what, I've always had this thing about me where once I start something, I have to finish it. Uh, and I just felt like I'd already got at that point, you could say eight weeks or, or 10 weeks of work. And to stop doing that would mean that all that were a waste of time. So, yeah, I just felt comp- uh, so strange looking back now why I did it and how I did it. And and to see where it's kind of come to now is, is, is just absolutely incredible, really. But it, very, very tough. Very, very tough to, to do it. There were times where I had to write just brief notes just to jog my memory and then write it a couple of, couple of hours after when I'd had some sleep. But it was just, yeah, incredibly tough. I can imagine, yeah. But would you say it has helped you during training or was it like more like a burden? More of a burden. It was an absolute burden. Uh, keeping it was a burden. Uh, there were there were times where I felt incredibly stressed knowing that I had to do it. Uh, like at the end of the day. There were times, many a times when people were getting, getting in bed and, and getting maybe the only four hours of sleep that they were going to get. And the first portion of, of, of that kind of sleep allowance that I was due, half an hour of which was spent writing a, writing a journal and a diary. So I constantly felt a bit like I were on the back foot, but yeah, I mean, I just, I just managed, just managed to keep it up. But uh, a really interesting question that I got on, on the last one was, uh, do you think it kept you in writing it? And I never really thought about that, but I just, in a sense, probably, yeah, it did because let's face it, you don't want to leave something and only have half a diary or a quarter of a diary because it's a, it's a terrible representation of failure, uh, physical, uh, reminder of failure. So maybe it did subconsciously, but it's something that I wasn't aware of at the time. Mm. But I guess in hindsight, you're happy that you did have oh, discipline yeah. and writing it every day. And- Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were guys that used to, like, sit on my bed on a night and they'd just be like, what are you doing? Like, what, like what, why are you doing this? And is your intention to write a book? What are you doing it for? Uh, they all had kind of respect and admiration for what I was doing. But I never, it never, ever, ever crossed the mind that I would one day turn it into a book. Uh, or anything like that. But now, like looking back 10, 15 years on, it, it just makes absolute sense now, uh, given where it's gone. But no, not at the time, no. Hmm. So from the journal, let's, let's talk a little bit about the actual training itself. And for the listeners who haven't read the book, take take us with you in that time. Like what was training like? What do, did you have to handle? Like... Um, tell us a little bit about that, what that, what that was like. Yeah, so I mean, training kind of, uh, it's the longest uh, basic military training course in the world to become a Royal Marines commando. It's 32 weeks long. We did 34 weeks. Uh, and it's not a feather in my cap whatsoever, but we got down there and they just, the training team deemed that not enough time for, not enough people for, for, to take through training because I think there were 21 that's, that started in my troop. And after 15 weeks, all that 21 might have gone. So that would have been a complete waste of, of a cycle of, of recruits going through. So we had to wait an extra two weeks for, 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 for another bunch of lads to come. And then we amalgamated and then we went through, we had, I think 58 people. But at that point, there'd been massive, massive selection cuts and, and joining, joining, uh, physical and mental stipulations that you had to pass. So there'd been, a, it were a good two and a half years before I actually started training and training is just, a, it's just horrendous. It's uh, 
the, I think the fabric of training is is around time pressure uh, and and sleep deprivation. The first fifteen weeks, it's all about getting rid of people that don't lack the aptitude or propensity to become Royal Marine commandos. So you get messed about a lot. You get kept you, you get kept awake, and uh, it's just incredibly arduous. Uh, and the, the physical tests are just incredibly tough. And I, I, we do, I think we'd lost fifty percent of, of of the lads within the first ten weeks. Uh, and, it, and it's strange because you, you get in there and you, and you think you're going to be doing all this kind of Hollywood based. Uh, ideals of soldier in like fast roping and all these like going in on 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 speed boats and and whatnot and and doing these attacks and it's not like that whatsoever. It's tra- trainings just designed to cut people out and have a finished product. Have the lads at the end that can do the job in terms of the finished product. So yeah, just in, in, incredibly incredibly raw and unbelievable experience. Uh, what was was mm-hmm. training really? What you said about sleep deprivation really blew my mind because, as you said, like 10 hours in two weeks, some people get that a night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would consider myself somebody who needs a, a lot of sleep or like a, a good amount of sleep. And I'm, I'm like, is there anything that you can do when you are like in this sleep deprived state? Yeah. Like anything to kind of keep you going or like get your mind like focused or yeah it's, what was that like again just incredibly tough and they say they say at Limston that sleep deprivation is 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 the uh is the window to the soul you find out who you are when you're sleep deprived and a lot of people really strong people just uh they fell away and questioned what they were doing under sleep deprivation uh, I, I don't think you know how you, you're going to handle it until you've actually it's actually thrown upon you. But I think in in terms of anybody that we're dealing with it, you you've I, I recently did some goal setting for a mental health uh, organisation charity, and one of the the aspects of goal setting that I kind of put forth was that I think when you're sleep deprived or you're going for a goal that that that's mundane and it's arduous and it's and it's really spaced over a long term you've got to imagine what failing looks like to you uh, rather than imagining yourself at the end and what the goal feels like you've got to imagine and feel the sense of failure and if you're not willing to take that on uh, it provides such a massive and stable anchor of, of stability for you in that goal acquisition. Uh, and I absolutely did that, just, I think, organically. I, I I didn't want to accept failure. And in that sense, I just I just continued on through the mundane. Uh, and, it, and it is, it's, it, it, training, especially sleep deprivation, it's about how, how, how much you can, in a sense, handle uh, suffering. Uh, and 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 just getting up and repeating the same behaviour again, and you're con- you're constantly on the back foot. You never know when you're going to sleep, and you might have two or three hours sleep, but like we like we know, it's just not enough. It wouldn't be enough if you were properly rested. You'd wake up the next day, and you'd be in a terrible state, uh, and you would be unproductive. But you just like anything in life human beings adapt, and you do adapt to having very very little sleep and being able to operate over a period of time hmm. when when i hear people like you sharing this their story about military training i often think that there there might be so many people out there who would think well i would never be able to do that but if you would have known what that training exactly looked like before like did you go into this like i know i can do this or were you like mm, i'm not quite sure or what, what like what was your yeah. attitude when you went into this and yeah I, I mean i didn't i absolutely didn't think i could do it not at all uh and nobody does you don't the beauty and the human engineering factor of about Ron Wayne's training is is that you never know you can do it until you've actually done it it's 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 
it's it's it's that unbelievable. Uh, my kind of thought process before was I've played rugby at a high level before, uh, and I walked away from that kind of career avenue, if you want to call it that. And I wanted to be in an in an elite environment. I wanted to test myself. I wanted to be the best. And the Royal Marines for me provided that vehicle to be in somebody of elite, to be an elite uh, an elite soldier. So I just thought to myself, whatever whatever amount of time I can spend in training is gonna make me a better person and make me better. Uh, and enhance my personal development. And I thought if I can get to like week 10, week 15, uh, great. But uh, that never would have been good enough, but I thought it will make me a better person. So I just got in there and just thought, you know what? I'll accept that this could be a year of hell in my life. But in terms of, I call it the sacrifice to life ratio in the book. I don't know if you can remember, but And the sacrifice to life ratio that I kind of encapsulated was that this is only going to be for 10 months. It's 10 months of suffering and sacrifice to change my life forever uh, and give me all the best life chances and completely change my life in in terms of how I felt about my own self-concept, but also the the opportunities and that that will come after it. And for that, I didn't think it were a difficult trade-off. I just thought I can, I can, if, if this is if, if it's only ten months of my life, surely I can endure whatever they've got to throw at me. And it was tough, well, but but I just thought if 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 this is if it, if it is the hardest thing in the world, I'm just going to stay there because it's only going to be ten months. And that's how I kind yeah, of I love, yeah, that's but, that's how I kind of got it into got it into my head, and how I kind of got mentally prepared to go down there and do it. I love what you said about the sacrifice to life ratio and it, it puts things into perspective. Yeah. Like it's a set, you sacrifice 10 months and that's a long time. Like many people don't even have to sacrifice such a long time yeah. to really change their lives in certain ways. So that's a huge takeaway. Yeah. And yeah. another thing that I think people can, can take from what you just shared was that even if you go into something, not believing that you can actually do it, you should ch- still just start and try it because as you said, you didn't really believe in being able to finish training absolutely until you not. did it. No, no, I, I absolutely didn't. And I would say to anybody, I mean, I did, I, I went to university uh, in 2014 and studied forensic psychology and I didn't think I could do that. But I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to give this a bash and I'll just break it down. The six year course, I'll break it down into year blocks and I'll just do it year by year. And I'll put all my effort into it and just learn as much as I can and get engrossed into it and live the experience. Uh, and six years later, I've done it. It's just a case of what I've learned from everything that I've done is that you need to initially expose yourself to the environment. And with exposure comes familiarity and, and, and an element of comfort. And once you've experienced and you've become conditioned to that environment, you're kind of on your way then. You start living differently and thinking differently and adapt. you, you adapt. And it's all about adapting. Could, can you do it at the moment? Can you complete the tasks at the end of training before you, at, at the base of the challenge? No. But over a period of time, you, 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 your mind becomes harder. You, you, you become more resilient to... To the, to, to the demands of training or any kind of course or goal that you're trying to pursue. So that's what I've learned really. It's just, you've, you've, just, got, you've just got to jump in there and, 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 and give yourself the time to adapt to the demands of whatever you're wanting to do and try and achieve. Hmm. That's so awesome. And, and you mentioned one story or one lesson, which is the first one from the book is to break things down, like you said, with the um, degree that you did you, you yeah. broke it down into years and courses and yeah. that makes it easier to grasp like what's in front of you and, and what steps you need to take to accomplish the, the task in the end so and you and, and for the listeners that's the what i really loved about the book is that it's two things actually the first thing is that you combine each week 
with a certain lesson that you learned during that week and you wrote down these lessons um, like in hindsight so after you finish training right yeah and that's the first thing that i love and then the second thing is that in my opinion with your degree in psychology you provide a very very unique perspective on this training because you have experienced this like first-hand practical and then you've studied psychology and you understand like some theoretical backgrounds of yeah. what has happened like to you during training and then to other people and like you combine these two things and i think that's what makes the book so unique so i, I really love that yeah no thank you thank you it's been great you know because people have got in touch and just said like thank you for writing something that's like nothing I've ever read before in terms of mind t mindset material. And I'd, a bit of background on, on, on it getting published, I, I, I wrote up the, the diary entries, which took about nine months. Uh, and then it went off to publishers and they were like, we, we, we're not really feeling it. So it got a lot of rejections. And then I, I managed to meet an agent after a very, very long process an up and down process. And my, uh, a literacy agent just said you need to add in lessons after each week and it was I'd ne i couldn't see it and it, and as soon as he said that it just made perfect sense and it was during lockdown during the first covid lockdown i just kind of locked myself in a flat in pontefract and uh grew a massive beard and and i just i went into absolute writing mode uh I look like Forrest Gump, mate. You know when he uh, he goes on that run and his beard grows and he's just been running for ages. I look a bit like that, writing, writing, writing. And uh, I just wrote up all the lessons in about about a year. Uh, and I just, I think once I'd done that, I knew I had something. It just I, once I just knew that what I'd done. Were, were different and special. I just had this this feeling and lo and behold, it went back to publishers and we got multiple publishing offers on it. So I knew at that point that I'd, that, that that something had, special had been done. That's interesting. Um, that might be a tough question, but can you pinpoint like why did you feel like that's the point where you had something special or is it, was it just like gut feeling? Yeah, no, I, it, it, it's strange. Once I'd wrote up the diary entries, I got told, look, they're very, very unique. And fr from a few people that had, that had read them, they were just like, we cannot put this down. We can't stop reading like day to day. We get to a week and we have to read another week. And so I knew there were kind of something there, but still it, it didn't feel uh, kind of like comprehensive, really. Once I'd in a sense, forensically broke down each week by pulling out a key point. Uh, it, I just, I, once I'd looked at it and read it, I just thought it's, I know for a fact it's going to get published. I just, I just, I don't know. I just had this feeling like it, 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 I, I know, I, I know it'll get published now. Uh, and that were exciting when I, when I, I knew mm -hmm. I had something then. That's awesome. Yeah. During the, the writing, um, do you feel like you had all these lessons in your head already and you just had to put them on paper or were there some things that you kind of only realized looking back at your diary entries and then figured out like, oh, I, I did this there, or I applied, applied this technique or like, yeah. what was that like? Yeah, again, that's a great question. I uh, What I did was, I mean, when he said you need to put lessons in, it nearly killed me and, and broke me mentally because I just thought, this is so much work. It's not done. It's so, so much work. So I looked at week one, I read week one, uh, and straight away compartmentalization jumped out. So I wrote about compartmentalization. And then the second week was like the construct of masculinity because we were talking about how, I talked about how, you view people in society, especially men, as uh, like your alpha male as somebody that's big, muscular in, in stature, potentially covered in tattoos. Uh, and there were a, a guy called Recruit Nero who was an ex-bouncer, who were a boxer, he had one, two in tattoos. And he just looked like the epitome of a Royal Marine commando from the start. And you just thought, this guy's going to do it all day long. And he left after two or three weeks. 
So that just broke that stereotype of kind of masculinity for me. So I thought, I'm going to write about that because that's a really important lesson. And then I just, in a sense, in the mindset role, but ripped it all up and just thought, I'm just going to write about psychological and social science topics on each lesson from a prominent thing that stands out. And to, to answer your question, mate, I uh, I was just, a, it was perfect. In terms of timing, I'd just finished at uni and then it, more or less my agent, uh, writing agent said, look, you need to think about the lessons. So I was just armed with all this knowledge and I were able just to look at these lessons and read each week and just be like, that's psychological, social science, we'll write about that. Uh, and it just absolutely allowed me just to really break training down in a, in a way that's just never been done before. But there were certain points where I needed to research and uh, and look at and just see how I could bring it and tie it all together. But but yeah, I think the the knowledge in the background and, and stuff and the experience and, and maturity uh, just allowed me to to kind of to, to, to do it that way. A lot of people have said, "Why didn't you do it before?" Uh, and the answer is, I just, I wasn't able to execute it in a way that I was now. I wouldn't have been mm. able to do it. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And now I want to get, I, I wrote down a couple lessons that you share from a couple of chapters, and I want to get into a couple of these. So one that really stood out to me was when you talked about acceptance and how you kind of learned and applied it during training so can you um tell the listeners a little bit like what do you mean with acceptance and yeah. how do you like practice it in the moment yeah yeah so i've been studying psychology now since 2014 uh currently looking at uh doing some phd research and work with with, with the university looking at rapid thinking so i've been really studying mindset for quite some time. And when I were in training, uh, I do actually, before, before I kind of go into this, I think the construct of the main construct and the main pillar and foundation of mental resilience and whether I think mental resilience is, uh, can remain resilient is another factor and probably another ch a chat worth having, but Uh, the main construct in terms of a short-term appliance of resilience is acceptance. I think if you can accept quickly in the moment, you have, in a sense, achieved optimal mental resilience. And I'll explain. So in training, I got to a point at about week 14, week 15, where I was just able to accept adversity quickly. So you have no control over your life and training whatsoever. The training team control everything. They tell you when to get changed, when to get a shower, when to go to sleep, when to wake up. They control every single aspect of your life. And I got to a point in training where you could argue there were an element of it that bordered on desensitization, but in a controlled setting, that was absolutely fine. Uh, but whatever the training team asked us to do, like throw all your stuff out the window, or pull everything out your locker or turn your beds upside down. I just got to a point where I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to accept this quickly. I'm just going to be like, yeah, whatever, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I'm just going to accept it because I can't change it. There's no point in me using energy up, uh, expanding negative energy, trying to, in a sense, counter this in my own head, saying, no, I don't want to do this and being reluctant to do it because uh, you're in the process of denial then of it happening. And while if you're in this process, you're not living in the moment and you're not being, you're not being effective. So I just thought, I'm just going to accept it. And that's what I did. I, ex I learned to accept very, very quickly uh, adversity and negative kind of aspects of training. And what it allowed me to do was just really keep on top of my mental my mental health and well-being uh, and not become stressed out by by anything i just if they wanted me to throw everything out the out the window i would do it and i'd be the first to go and get it back while everybody else were arguing about doing it 
and and it just allowed me to be the first to do it, be the first to get it back and get it all admin and get it all all back right, and I could continue forward more efficiently. Mm. And I think like just learning to accept because the thing is with accept the thing is with with uh, adversity and stuff that happens instantly that are negative that you don't want to happen. You can't change it. It's happened. So while ever you're in that previous reality mentally, uh, you're not living in the current reality and you're not adapting to it quickly. It's it's acceptance and it's change. It's adapting to change quickly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I learned to accept very quickly. And, and I think once you can accept that things are not going to go your way all the time and how you bounce back from that change is, is absolutely fundamental to being successful. Mm. And it's so incredibly hard to to learn that and to do that. But as you said, it's it's such a valuable, I would call it a skill kind of yeah. a way of thinking. And you have to practice it. To do. You, you, have to, yeah. you have to really practice it. And uh, there's been times since I've less train, training, more recently really, where things have not gone my way and I've, I have become disillusioned I, I, and, 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 and uh, frustrated and, uh, and and not handled it very well. And I've always had this like thing that I learned from training work, which is just accept it. And I say that to myself, like if something goes, with, just accept it, just accept it. And I keep drilling that into my mind and it just reminds me that I need to get to acceptance quickly. And then I can I can move on. I can move on and be effective. But it is tough. It is tough. It's not easy. Mm. But at some point, you will accept what's happened. So why not shorten that period and just accept a lot quickly if you can? And you can do it under practice. Absolutely, yeah. And the next um, lesson I wanted to talk about, which I feel like ties in a little bit with this acceptance is when you talked about self-control, like when the... Um, trainers had you like during the exercises you weren't allowed to do certain things like I think it was wipe away your sweat or stuff like that or when you like felt a, a tickling sen sensation somewhere but you were um, in a certain situation you like weren't allowed to scratch yourself or stuff like that and um, can you can you expand a little on that like what what it was like in training and how it it helped in actual combat situations or in life in general absolutely yeah so uh so the gym in the gymnasium uh which you spend the first nine weeks of training uh is where you learn how to do like rope climbs you do a thing called imf which is a it's like a coordinated body kind of movement thing where you you kind of the training you to react to orders basically uh and your your body to move in certain ways that is uh really in sync and in time with orders but collaborated am, a, a, amongst the troop uh and it's it's such an intense environment in the when i say the gymnasium it's like a big school hall with ropes and, and apparatus it's not a gym with, with with weights and stuff uh and it's so so intense and coordinated and militarized and uh and whatnot and obviously as you start sweating uh you have a natural kind of reaction as a human being to like wipe your face or wipe under your eyes and and like wipe your eyebrows or it tickles and you start itching and fidgeting and they call them the uh like the ptis or or, or the staff whatever you want to call them or strikers, they're called strikers, because the the and they're coming round and there might be three or four or five of all or maybe more and they're coming round and they're constantly correcting your body position and like putting your shoulders back or they're saying like do not fidget, do not fidget, stand perfectly still. Uh and you you cannot at all you can't wipe your face, you can't fidget. You've got to stand like completely emotionless. Uh, and 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 motionless in terms of movement, and you're always thinking like what? Apart, aside from the military nonsense and the discipline side of it, is is what what? Why is this? Why is this? And then it all just becomes massively apparent. It's like when you go on operations, 
if you like, say for instance, in, in an OP, an observation post, for days on end, observing the enemy and taking in intelligence, or you're equally behind enemy lines or whatever, and you're in a compromised position where movement could compromise your position and get you killed, touching your face or, I don't know, getting a spider off your face or reacting to something and moving quickly or, or whatever, or could compromise your position and your team's position. So they drill that into you in the gym so that you become so self-controlled in an operational environment. And I just thought that that were absolutely fascinating that they'd kind of found a way to reduce human reaction time. Uh, sorry, human reactions uh in order to produce something at the other end. I just in terms of human engineering, I just thought it were absolutely genius. Uh and yeah, that that were the that were kind of the lesson that I wrote about in self control. I just thought that that were your inability to touch yourself when you're sweating is such a natural reaction that we all do without even thinking. But the re, the they remove that and it all in terms of it's attention to detail, isn't it? They're looking at the finer points of human behaviour and how that impacts you in 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 operations and stuff and and and, and wartime. So, just incredible, incredible. Mm. I find it fascinating because it's kind of like rewiring, like these natural reflexes Absolutely. that you have and kind of untraining them. So that's very interesting. Yeah. And it, I also, like, what I also find interesting is that most of the things that you were taught during training or what you took away from it, they seem to be very basic, like very simple, but they're incredibly hard to do. Yeah. So it, it's interesting, like, they, they focus during these 32 weeks, it seems like they focus a lot on getting you the, the basic stuff. Yeah. And, and really drilling it. Yeah. down like that did you have it like it's it's affection yeah it's it's mastering the basics uh mastering the basics is what produces elite outcomes in in human performance it is absolutely it is so basic but it's so hard to do and it's like attention to detail it's like doing the things behind closed doors or when you're not under the spotlight that people overlook, don't think that they matter, but they have a massive, massive impact in terms of your ability to be ahead of the game, to be outstanding, to be elite. And it's exactly that. It's, it's a rewiring of the human condition in order to rebuild something with very, very basic blocks, building blocks, that then produces elite outcomes. And that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, the lesson on uh, attention to detail, the controller and the dismisser, the hypothetical people that I kind of drew upon in that lesson, you have one, you have one kind of type of person in training that really gets on with their administration and gets everything done under discipline so that they can get in bed and sleep and then you have another person which is the dismisser that kind of doesn't think that all this small stuff matters and that they can do the washing and the ironing late at night and they sleep first and then forgo the sleep throughout the night but then when they're trying to do the the work on a night the majority of lads are trying to get their heads down and, and go to sleep so they're under pressure then to turn the lights off to stop making noise and get in bed. And what happens is over a period of time, just that very, very basic behavior catches up with them and they become under pressure. Uh, they no longer are able to absorb the demands of training uh, mentally. Uh, and and they either drop out of training, they get back trooped to go back and re relearn various aspects of training, but also... And I, th I thought that was just a an unbelievable observation and, and fascinating really once I looked at that and really sat down and thought about it that yeah like attention to detail and stuff and, and self-control if mm -hmm. it's not 
and a focus on the basics. If you have not got the focus on the basics, you, you'll 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 never ach- fully achieve what you, what you're able to achieve. No, and I think what everybody can take away from this is that often we tend to overcomplicate things. Like we want to do the fancy stuff, and like we want to make it like incredibly hard for ourselves. But instead, if we just really ensure that we get the basics right yeah. in, in most things we already ha- do the most important thing if we just do the basics so and that's that, that's a that good be, yeah exactly that mate it's like everybody wants to do the fancy stuff first and it's that is so inherent in training every single recruit that joins and starts training wants to do the fancy stuff first without doing the basics and getting the basics right I I I want to do the fancy stuff. For everybody does, and that is the main killer of training. I think people come, they want into fast rope out of helicopters, they want into fire weapons and blow doors off or whatever you, you want to call it, uh, and you don't even look at that until week eighteen, week twenty, and mm. their inability to focus on the basics and just trust the process. It is what sabotages yeah. their their goal aspiration in that. The what you talk about towards the end of the book, and that's kind of the last thing I want to get into, is really how these weeks in training have shaped you, and like you also say that you really transformed. It's like a new version of yourself came out of this training. So I, I would want you to. Explain a little bit for the listeners, like what changed? How did you realize that, and in what way that did it shape you? Yeah, I had no self confidence going into training. Uh, again, I'd, I'd, I'd played rugby. I played rugby from a really, really young age and reached some levels of success in that. Uh, but I kind of not self sabotaged my career, but I, I left because I felt that my value was worth a lot more in rugby league, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and I joined the Marines and I just, I had no idea that I could do it, as we've, as we've previously mentioned. But going under, going on that journey uh, and overcoming the small incremental obstacles, it just reinforced and re-nurtured and re-galvanized my uh, my self-confidence and I got to a, a point where I had what I term and this is a part of kind of book two I had I'd arrived at like intrinsic self-confidence and by intrinsic I mean that I absolutely knew that I could back myself to do anything that I didn't need anybody else and that no matter what, I knew I could get through it and I would get through it, no matter how tough it got. And I think once I'd arrived at that point in that kind of self-understanding, I were literally unstoppable by an injury and I were always going to do it, even though at the time I didn't think I could do it or I quest. that's a bit counterintuitive. I, I knew I could do it, but I was scared of injury as everybody is. But I arrived at a place where I just thought, no matter what happens, I'm going to be here and I'll still be here at the end and I'm not going home. Going home's not an option. It's not even on my radar going home or saying that I can't do this. And I think once I'd arrived there and I I knew I could back myself to do do it, I I were unstoppable. And that's what I think that reaching the end of that journey gives you. It gives you that gift of self-understanding that you can back yourself to do anything and that's ultimately why a lot of raw marines that then leave the marines are massively successful in everything that in every single avenue that they go into because mm-hmm. the absolute that they, they, they can back themselves they know that they can do whatever they need to do to to be successful and that's i yeah. think that's the main the main kind of well, it is the main thing that I took away from completing training, really. That's huge, yeah. So, for people who 
don't or didn't go to training or don't plan to go through like some kind of military training but they would want to s the same outcome it's obviously not exactly the same but they want to feel that sense of i can do whatever i i intend to do like what would be your suggestion or recommendation uh, yeah. what should they do to get to that point if it's not military training the same can be applied and you can produce the same outcome. Whatever it is that you are interested in or that you want to do, whether it's traveling or it's an element of personal training, uh, sorry, personal development, or it is a certain career path or a goal, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. And by that, I mean the place of emotional and mental safety that you're currently in where it doesn't challenge your self-concept and by self-concept I mean the thoughts and feelings and emotions that you have if you're not successful you've got to break away from that and you've got to throw yourself into it you've got to not be afraid of external validation what will people think of me uh, if I'm not successful? Will they laugh at me? Will they be happy that I've failed? You've got to put that to one side and you've got to throw yourself into whatever you want to do. And you've got to give yourself the opportunity to withstand the knee-jerk reaction to go back into your comfort zone if you face adversity or things start going wrong. You've got to give yourself the opportunity to become familiar become to familiarize yourself with that new environment because once you've conditioned your mind and your body to that new environment you're on your way and while you're on that journey your self confidence and your personal growth it has to grow it has to uh, it has to develop uh, and you will arrive at the end of that process in such a better place than you were if you stayed in the realms of comfort. So whatever it is that you need to do, you've just got to, you just got to act. You just got to act upon that. And if that's just sending a simple email to start the, the journey, picking up the phone or putting your trainers on to go for a walk and eventually wanting to run a marathon, you've just got to take them small steps and, and get into that. Yes. Wow. There was a, a great takeaway for people, I guess, in like how they can apply it. And yeah, kind of a good summary and, and practical thing that they can now start doing. So it's, it's a good timing that we included this towards the end of the episode. So I love that. Um, one more question I have for you is, um, since the show is called The Power of Books and it's all about highlighting like great books and how it can change your life, and I'm curious, do you have any books that have like really impacted your life? Yeah, I tell you what had a, a huge impact on my life. Uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. I can remember I read that uh, and I finished that in two days, uh, and that was the first book that I'd ever read and finished in two days. That was kind of an enlightening kind of process for me where I just thought wow like I never knew a book could kind of do that to you uh, mm. and then I read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell uh, and I just thought that was absolutely incredible and I would urge anybody uh, that's interested in kind of performance and where talent comes from and how it kind of is elicited, elicited to read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell because he is just, his forensic breakdown of performance and people and success is, is incredible. Uh, I read The Slight Edge. Uh, the Slight Edge again got me through a really difficult time in the life. Uh, another fantastic book on, on, I suppose in a sense, compartmentalization, but attention to detail and managing the small things and how the small things uh, like the butterfly effect end up being massive uh, and, 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 and significant building blocks. 
so yeah, I think they're they're kind of books that that really are there straight away when you ask me that question. Awesome, thank you for sharing these. And and lastly, I want to give you the chance to to let people know where they can connect with you, where they can find like um, more information about you, your your um, content and everything. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, uh, my authoring profile on Instagram is Gareth Timmins Author. The handle is Gareth Timmins Author. You can catch me there and drop me questions, whatever, and I'll get back to you. Uh, and then I've got 0.1 Clothing and 0.1 Projects, which is performance fitness wear uh, website www.0.1.co.uk uh, we sell like clothing and, and literature and books and stuff and uh, public speaking so yeah anywhere like that you can you can, you can grab me and I'll, I'll be there great and I will also link um, to everything you mentioned in the show notes so people can directly access everything brilliant fantastic so to all the listeners and people who are watching, I'm going to show the, the cover of the book once more oh, for the first time, actually. But I really encourage you to check out the book. It's it's a great read, very easy to read because it's in a diary journal kind of way, but so many great lessons and takeaways have we ta as we talked about today. So Gareth, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. No problem, mate. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been it's been great. Thank you. And to all the listeners, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you the next time, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Power of Books. As always, you will find all the relevant links for today's episode in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode please make sure to subscribe so that you will get notified whenever a new episode drops. And you would do us a huge favor if you could give us a five-star review on your favorite platform. I hope to see you next week. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep growing. Bye-bye.